Okay. All righty, good afternoon, everybody. So we're gonna get started here with the fourth session for Career Academy, how to be professional, remote, or in-person. And we will be recording this for YouTube. So all of you are probably going to be re reviewing this and viewing it on YouTube. Make sure to complete the survey at the end of this session so that you can earn credit for attending today. And I'll explain a little bit more about the purpose of that in the next slide. But to officially introduce myself, my name is Samantha Karpeloff. I am the assistant director on the career team and I work mainly out of the Dobbs Ferry campus. I work with students in the School of Business. And today we'll be, of course, talking about how to be professional. This is hopefully gonna be helpful, not just for interview purposes, but when you start your entry level jobs and get out into the working world, whether that will be in a hybrid format or if you're going to be going to the office every day, we're gonna review some strategies for professionalism, no matter which way you work. So let me get started with a little bit about Career Academy. So just a reminder, I'm gonna move everybody over to the left here so we can see this perfectly. Okay, so with Career Academy, these are sessions designed to help prepare you for the workforce. And we're going over basic topics like resume writing, interview preparation, with this workshop, professionalism, and then next week, or a couple weeks actually, LinkedIn. So you'll be able to view all of those recordings on our YouTube channel, which is Mercy College Career Team. And if you attend three of five sessions or watch three of five recordings and you complete the surveys for each of those sessions, you'll be eligible for a digital badge for your LinkedIn profile. There's the lovely badge right there. This is a nice benefit to have to show that you've really been preparing for your career throughout your time at Mercy. It can help set you apart from other candidates as well when you're applying to internships and jobs. So great to have this badge. And if you also attend these sessions, you'll be eligible to win a pair of Apple AirPods. So you'll be entered into a raffle for that. And I think it's pretty exciting because we always like to have some kind of reward or prize associated with this series. Alrighty, so I'm going to jump in to today's topic of professionalism. And I need to give some background before I start to talk about professionalism specifically. It's really important to highlight the NACE Career Readiness Competencies. And NACE is a association that our team follows. It has informed a lot of what we do with all of you students, including the Career Readiness Competencies. These came out, I believe, earlier this year. They update them pretty frequently. And essentially, the competencies are helping to demonstrate core competencies that broadly prepare you for success in the workplace and lifelong career management. And so they are, as you can see here, career and self-development, communication, critical thinking, equity and inclusion, leadership, and of course, professionalism, which we'll be talking about today teamwork and technology. And so you can go on to NACE's website to learn more about each of these. However, as career coaches, we're always trying to encourage you to display these, whether in your resume or in your cover letters. When preparing you for interviews, we're making sure that you're equipped with stories and explanations about these different skills, because all of you will at some point, even if you only take classes, learn these skills in a variety of ways, through class projects, through your assignments. Hopefully you'll go beyond the classroom and have internships, part-time jobs, join clubs, attend events like this one. And so you can gain these skills through those experiences and you know, kind of wrap it up all into one package. So let me move on to what it means to be professional. I realize I need to be presenting this. So let me see if this works. Can everybody see that okay? Alan, can you give me an okay there? Yes. No. Um, uh, what does professional you, mean? Yeah, can you see that all right? Yeah, yes. But okay. there's no content, we, just the title. Great. Yeah, that's we, the way it should be. Okay. <laughs> cool. We we see it as a presenter screen, by the way, Sam. That's what I thought was happening. All right. Yeah, I don't think that's how you want us to. No, I, think See, yeah. I didn't set up the settings properly. So we'll just look at it like this. No worries. Okay. So in terms of the word professional, there's a lot of different phrases that we toss around on the career team, but you probably have heard through interviews and preparing for your career, like dressing professionally 
and having a professional presence, whether that's in person when you're in an interview or through your social media online, professional social media accounts. That's something we bring up if, for example, you're a media studies student and you want to curate your work somewhere. You do want to have a separate Instagram, for example, that only shows your work and doesn't mix in, you know, your personal life in there. And so that's a time where you will probably hear that phrase tossed around. And then professional development. That's something that all of us professionals in the workforce hopefully are striving for to keep up with current trends in our fields and make sure that in terms of the career team, we're presenting you with the most current accurate information uh, to help you be prepared for the workforce. So those are just some common phrases that you probably have heard at one point or another. As for NACE's definition of professionalism, it essentially is knowing that work environments differ greatly. Hopefully you will understand and demonstrate effective work habits through gaining professionalism and act in the interest of the larger community and workplace. And I highlighted effective work habits because I think that really summarizes what it means to be professional in a nutshell. And as you can see from this definition, it will differ greatly depending on whether you work in finance and healthcare and education. There's a lot of different factors that influence professionalism. And I've listed four of them there actually. So starting with industry type, like I was just saying, if you work in corporate finance, you know, the definition of professionalism will be different there compared to if you are a teacher at an elementary school or if you work on a construction site, that's gonna be different uh, in terms of being professional compared to if you're a nurse in a hospital. So it will differ with workplace culture as well. That can look something like dress codes. So at my last workplace, we had a casual dress code where employees were welcome to wear jeans every day to the office. But if we were going to a client site to be visiting or working on a project in person with them, then we would dress up a little bit more, more, more than business casual, more like business professional. And so that is an example of how workplace culture influences the definition of professionalism depending on where you are. Then there's performance expectations. So anything from managing your time, managing your workload, how you communicate, the performance expectations that your manager has of you and that maybe are set from the top within the C-level of your business, that all influences and funnels down to you and how you're expected to act, essentially behavior here. And then lastly, core values of a company, which normally can be found in a company's mission statement. So that's viewable on their website, but professionalism is interwoven within that as well. Core values range from all over and it can be different for different firms within the same industry too. So this is really good information to keep in mind when you're preparing for an interview. Often you will be finding these things in your research for a company, a role, an industry. And this all influences professionalism and what the definition per organization means. So you're probably seeing these things already without really realizing it. Another note on professionalism is what employers really are looking for. And so you can kind of understand that from the research you'll be doing and the things that I mentioned in the last slide. But they're looking in a nutshell for people who will contribute to their business success and to their culture and who possess courtesy, respect, trust, and are reliable. All these things are really making up the definition of being a professional and you know, being professional. And I think an example of that first point on business success and culture can probably be really nailed down in what a business's goals are. So again, when you're looking at a company's website and doing research, they'll often outline their mission statement, what their goals are. If you look them up in the news, you'll see trends and things that are going on in their business. And that can help inform you of you know, really what kind of workplace this is and what kind of culture they set. In terms of the second point there, you know, there's lots of different examples of how showing courtesy, respect, and building trust can manifest. But I think the best way to do that is just to, first of all, be yourself, but also make sure that you're bringing a positive attitude to an interview or to your work day. And that really probably will have you be courteous and be respectful and start to gain trust 
of your coworkers and your manager because you'll have a good attitude and you know go into the day with the right mindset. And therefore you'll probably also be reliable. And by just following that simple, I suppose, golden rule of doing the right thing, I think that that will put you on the right path to being a professional in the workplace, but it definitely takes time. So you have to be patient with yourself and learn for, from your colleagues and your manager uh, to understand what is really expected and how you should be acting. All right, so there are a lot of different ways that as I've alluded to, professionalism can look. So let's jump into some ex examples here. I've outlined a few things, as you can see, that you should do every day on the job, but this of course applies to being prepared for interviews as well, in person or virtual. And so number one is arrive in time. You know, you've heard this probably over and over again, if you, especially if you've met with one of us to prepare for an interview, or if you are going on an interview for the first time, it's really very, very important to be on time. And there's that phrase that we throw around that on time is early, or, um, and then, and I believe it goes that, uh, or early is on time, excuse me, and then on time is late and late is unacceptable. So you wanna make sure to arrive a few minutes early because then you'll be prepared for if on the commute to the interview, for some reason there's traffic, you know, you might build in that time to allow yourself a few minutes to get settled. And if you end up um, being late, then, you know, hopefully you'll plan that into your community so you don't have to worry about uh, making a bad first impression. And so that's a really easy way to be professional is just to manage your time appropriately and get to, whether it's a meeting or an interview, get there at the appropriate time. Then of course, dressing professionally. So this is something important for an interview or for, as I'm showing here, every day in the workplace. But that can mean different things depending on your workplace. So like I was saying at my last job, I was encouraged to dress casually for everyday work at the office. That didn't mean though, you know, coming in sweatpants. You want to have a business casual attire in that case. But for some organizations and for some workplaces, it does mean that you should be dressing more professionally with business professional attire, which we have a lot of examples on our website of. But for men, that could be a dress shirt and slacks. And for women, that can be uh, a skirt and a nice dress shirt or a nice dress as well. And so that will already you know, set the tone for how you, met, how you hold yourself and the, uh, I suppose, impression that you're giving off. And it's really important to pay attention to that. And then lastly, to show that you're professional and that you're a working professional interested in moving up in where, whatever job you're in or industry, you wanna make sure that you're listening carefully to those around you and asking thoughtful questions. So often I find myself in meetings and if new information is presented, I wanna make sure I'm thinking about that information and asking questions when I'm unsure or when a point is made that I want clarity on. It's important to show that you're paying attention, but also that you are in that sense, you know, when you ask questions, contributing ideas, because you're not just an employee sitting there doing a job and that's it. It's, you're hired because there's a problem that the company or team has and they're looking for someone to solve it. So they wanna hear your feedback and input. That can definitely be uh, scary at times to think that you are not asking the right questions or to even ask one in general. But I think if you have a mentor or even you can go see your manager to ask them really what if your question is um, coming off in the right way, that can be very helpful to figure out if you're acting professionally and uh, you know should be seeing that through. So I think, again, these three things are really key for interviews. You know, you want to make sure you're listening. So that you ask the right questions at the end, because let's say you have a list of questions prepared, but they might come up throughout the interview. You don't want to be caught off guard and ask them a second time because that won't look very good. And then when it comes to dressing professionally, of course, you'll be doing that for interviews to give your best first impression and arriving on time, very key as well for any meeting, but especially to give a good impression for interviews. All right, so I'm gonna to jump to a couple examples or really slides on how to be professional when you're working virtually. 
And this is true with email, of course, because we're all doing emails, whether we are working in person or if we're working remotely or on a hybrid schedule. There are a lot of key things to keep in mind when it comes to writing good emails that are helpful to your teammates and allow you to manage your time appropriately. So when it comes to email, the first thing you want to keep in mind is to make your message easy to read. I think with that, it essentially means to keep your message short and to the point. You don't need to give too much detail or <coughs> information. Oh, bless you, Alan. Uh, you want to keep things short and to the point. <clears throat> Second, you always want to include your message in the body of the email. So don't use the subject line to type too much. Right. Keep the subject brief and yeah. then at the in the body of the email, write your message and again, make it short. Uh, and then in the same idea, you're going to use the subject line appropriately. So that means keeping the message in the subject clear. As my example here shows, maybe if you're sending us a resume to have us review, use the title something along the lines of updated resume for your review so that it's clear what your purpose is. And, you know, I can understand from the subject line what it is that you need help with instead of just the word resume, because that doesn't really get the point across. Next, you want to make sure your email address is professional. We always say this when it comes to writing resumes, but don't use something personal that may have to do with your hobby, like I love basketball 26 or something like that. Use maybe your Mercy email or create a new email in Gmail, for example, that has your first and last name in it or something along those lines. Next, you also want to focus on the recipient's needs when writing your email. And I think this really pertains to the interview process, but it's good to practice in your daily email writing. You know, people on the other end of your emails probably have a lot going on. And so you want to make sure that you're being respectful of their time and keeping the email short, but also focusing on what it is that the task that you're describing or the project that you're working on, you make it clear to them that you know, you've done these things and you're ready to deliver on, on certain things they're asking you for. Next, you wanna make sure you communicate your purpose early on in the email. So often I start emails with the reason I'm writing is dot, 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 or I'm writing to reach out about X, Y, or Z. And when it comes to job hunting, this was, I think, specific to looking for internships or jobs, but you want to include your pitch, your elevator pitch. So maybe this is a job that you heard about through one of your connections and they gave you someone's contact information to reach out to them. You want to very early on in that email, drop the reason again that you're communicating with them, but talk a little bit about yourself. Give that short elevator pitch that should be a few sentences long so they can get a sense of who you are. Uh, and again, you're being respectful of their time in that way. And then you wanna end your email with a clear call to action. So if there's a task or project you're working on and you're giving your manager an update, for example, uh, you wanna let them know what the next step is. Or maybe if you're emailing a connection about a job or internship, you add at the end of your email, look forward to hearing from you. As in, you know, the ball's in their court, it's up to them for the next step and, and when that will take place. And lastly, this is something I can't drill home enough, and I know I need to work on it myself, making sure that I check my messages for spell spelling and grammar, because that is the number one way to make a good first impression is to make sure that you don't have any spelling or any grammar mistakes for your emails, for your resume, for your cover letter, really important stuff there. Okay, moving on to instant messaging, which again is another way that you can practice professionalism in a virtual world. And this is becoming really common, I think, from the pandemic. But of course, we had IMs before in various platforms like social media. And some of us were probably using Teams and Skype chat when that was still very popular. So here are a few things to keep in mind to make sure that you're using those platforms appropriately. Number one would be to make sure that you know the person. So this is actually not something that will happen if you're reaching out cold to someone on LinkedIn, for example. If you haven't met a particular connection on LinkedIn before, but maybe someone introduced you, you won't know them in advance, but you do in that case want to send a short introductory note, letting them know how you heard about them and why you're reaching out. 
it's always important to hit on those two things. And then the second thing here, being mindful of the receiver's preferred style of communication. I would say that this is important probably most of the time when you are familiar with that person's communication style. Maybe you know that a colleague of yours would rather talk about something in person rather than I am, I am about it. Um, but if you know that that person is busy, I think that that should be the default, should be to send them an instant message instead of interrupt them. Because that allows them to answer the message on their own time instead of having um, you know, someone walk up to them in the middle of the meeting, for example. You also want to keep the conversation short when it comes to instant messaging. Uh, because it is instant messaging, if there, there is something that you would normally be discussing live in a conversation or if it would be better for email because you need to flesh things out and write more detail about it, then that would be those would be the appropriate platforms to have that conversation on. But remember that I am is really for quick uh, it's really for quick communication. And also for, of course, when someone is busy and can't necessarily attend to something you want them to do right at that very minute. Be careful with abbreviating. I think this is something important, not necessarily for your colleagues at work, but perhaps for people you're just getting to know. So again, going back to the LinkedIn example, make sure to spell out any abbreviations that you would normally use, especially you know text abbreviations. You you want to make sure to not use those if you can, and instead just spell out the words that you're trying to use. But it's also true for any um, acronyms that you might include on your resume. So I always tell students to, instead of listing an acronym, make sure to spell it out because you can't assume that the person reading your resume will exactly know what that means. And then on to the second to last point here, avoid changing meeting times and locations via IM. That's important because you know it can get confusing to know where, or know where or when that change might have come up. You can always go back to an email to or a calendar invitation to see kind of proof of that change. But if someone's just messaging you very quickly and you forget that a meeting place or time has changed, it can be easy to um, oversee that and forget that that was the case. And lastly, you want to end any conversations with a short closing message. Most of the time, that is thank you. But that's something that you should do via email as well. So don't forget to always thank people for the work they're doing for you, or maybe if they're doing a favor for you, you want to make sure to make that noted. All right. And so, of course, we'll talk about virtual meetings in this presentation today because that is a lot of the work that all of us are doing, whether we are mostly in person, there's some aspect of Zoom or maybe uh, Teams meetings that goes on in just about everyone's workplace these days. So we definitely have to mention that. And it's true for interviewing as well. You'll be able to find this lovely resource that I've shared here on our career website uh, that outlines different preparation steps for virtual interviewing. And that's actually what I've included on this slide here in terms of testing video and audio, making sure that you have good lighting, dressing appropriately, keeping your environment free of distractions, and communicating clearly. When it comes to virtual meetings, it's really, really important to do that last thing. I think maybe more than any of the others, of course, they're all important. And the reason I want to highlight that communicating clearly is maybe one of the most key things to keep in mind is that if for some reason the internet connection where you are isn't strong or if someone you know misunderstands you it is more easy to do that over a virtual meeting just like it's easier to misread an email or misunderstand a written message of any kind so you do want to make sure you're communicating clearly being detailed in what you're saying and uh, clarifying any misunderstandings between you and the other person a couple other things to know about these other points. To test your video and audio, we do have a resource for that uh, called speedtest.net, I believe. So that's a good way to test your internet speed and make sure that your video and audio will run smoothly. And that would probably also mean that you would get into your meeting in advance of the session, or maybe you would host a separate Zoom meeting and just with yourself to double check that those functions are working appropriately. You wanna have good lighting as well. So you know, again, these things are really important for 
interviews, but you want to bring your professional self to the virtual world that you're in if you're at your internship or job. So to make sure that your lighting is good will again give that good impression of professionalism. You want to dress appropriately, which we went over before, depending on your workplace, that can look differently. And then keeping your environment distraction free, which essentially means that if you live with anybody, if you have any pets, just make sure that they are aware that you will be in a meeting at a certain time or keep them out of their room. And also, um, you know, if you can, to the extent that you're able to, don't have any background noise while you're in your meetings. That can be difficult, though, because some of us live in busy areas. So I would just say, you know, if you're unable to do that, make sure to give a disclaimer or some kind of message at the beginning of your meeting to let everybody know that you're not working in um, an environment that will be necessarily very quiet, because that will, that will give everybody a heads up and that will be good. So some other examples that I thought of, and I think that these are also going to be epic modules that some students will be completing for homework at some point. So you'll probably hear, if you're one of those people, you'll hear about these later. Being reliable is a great way to show professionalism. An example of this might be that you submit your work by your deadlines, and if you can't, then you let your manager know that you need an extension. Being prepared bringing notes to a meeting um, that you've, you know, showing that you've already taken action on a few things. I think that's really important is to come to the meeting being prepared to share what work you have done instead of using the meeting to complete that work. Because again, everyone's time is very val valuable. And for the most part, when you do meet, you want to give an update on where things are and then, you know, go away and work on projects on your own. Acting with integrity, which essentially means having good morals and an example of that might be being honest when you make mistakes. So everybody will do that at one point or another, or many times if you're me, for example, <laughs> and you wanna make sure that you're honest with your teammates, if you're working on a project with them or your manager uh, or whoever it is that you're working with when things aren't going well and you know try to nip those mistakes in the bud instead of reacting to them later. And lastly, another example is being dedicated. It's a great way to consider oneself professional, putting in extra hours on a project to make it perfect uh, when it's close to a deadline or when you know it's going to get visibility of managers or people higher up. Really important to show your dedication to a project, a company, an internship, and really follow through and just do the best you can because those are the people who will definitely get noticed. So one last note on equity and professionalism. I'm just going to hint at this today, but we will have a separate session on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion at the end of November this year. So when it comes to professionalism and equity, this is really a perspective that hiring managers need to keep in mind. So it's not necessarily anything for you as students to do, but just information for you to be armed with so you're aware you're going into interviews when you're looking for the right company to work for. Uh, these are all important points to keep in mind. So starting with the first one, culture and identity often play a role in how people connect and engage. That's inevitable. That's a really obvious fact. And you know, that's kind of one of those, I think, um, factors that's always going on underneath the surface. You know, we connect with and remember people and engage with people who might look more like us or who have similar interests to us. And so it's important for organizations to remember that when they're trying to structure their hiring plans and have the right people hired, uh, especially to ensure that there's a diverse group of people that they're hiring and not everybody is the same. Next, there will always be or instances in the workplace when professionalism and authenticity intersects it could be at odds, particularly when it comes to underrepresented groups. So again, this is something that we'll talk more about in that upcoming workshop we'll be doing at the end of November. But an example of this could be that someone's hair texture or style is not approved of by a hiring manager or a recruiter. And that's not something that you have control over, but it is, of course, something that I think the workplace in general is trying to move forward and um, improve the standards of not necessarily judging anybody for the way that they look, but making sure that that is not a factor in the, in the hiring process. 
and in making people feel comfortable and welcome at their workplace. And lastly, uh, organizations, again, this is for employers to keep in mind, but they need to be mindful that the line between professionalism and preference must be clearly communicated to avoid any bias and discrimination. But good things for all of you who will be applying to internships and jobs to keep in mind and to look out for when you are going through the application process. But for more info, make sure to stay tuned for, I think it's November 30th that our workshop will be taking place and we'll be able to speak a lot more to all of these things then. So that was everything I had to share today. Thank you all online for watching this recording. If you want to attend our next workshop, which I definitely suggest that you do, that will be taking place on December 2nd at 3 p.m. It will be at the Bronx campus for the in-person portion and then on Zoom, of course, as we have also been offering these sessions. And the topic is LinkedIn, building your brand. To complete the survey, make sure to scan this QR code and complete the short answer questions. And as a reminder, that's the only way that we'll be able to capture that you attended or that you watch this later. So make sure to do that. It takes maybe a couple of minutes to complete that.